Hello, everybody. We're going to start at the top of the hour. I thank you for joining me today, and we will get started then. Until then, I'm just going to sit and stare at you, and you can stare at me. All right, everybody, good morning, afternoon, depending on what time zone you are in today, or good right now <laughs> to everybody. Thank you for joining day two of our Critical Access Financial and Operational um, Virtual Conference. I My name is Amy Graham, and I'm going to be your facilitator for about the next 40 minutes, and then I'm going to head it, hand it off to my colleague, Wade Gallen. But until then, just to give you a few housekeeping items, um, you are muted in right now, so you cannot cannot chat cannot talk to us on this recording. However, there are chat and Q and A features available. So if you send a chat through, or you send a Q and A through, I'll be able to see that and answer any questions that you may have. I don't mind if you um, send me something in the middle of the presentation. Just uh, ask questions about it, that's fine and dandy. All of these sessions that are going on today and yesterday will be recorded, so that will be available. And the slide deck and the recording will be made available to all registrants following the webinar. You will probably receive an email from Jeff Summer from Stroudwater that will have a link to that in there. So just be on the lookout for that email coming through by the end of the week. If you don't get it, my name's Amy. Feel free to shoot me a message or just a reply back to Stroudwater info, info at stroudwater.com and we will get you the deck to you. And then at the end of this entire session, there's going to be a short survey and your feedback's really important to us because we'd like to know, you know, what can we improve on? Did you enjoy it? Did you not? Um, and you know, just to learn more about it because we appreciate the time you've given us today and want to make sure that it is of value to you. So that's how we get that information is just with, with that survey after the presentation. Just to give you an update um, about Stroudwater, you might have, if you were here yesterday, you would have had one of my colleagues share this slide with you. We've been in business since two, 1985. And in the, since 2017, we just started tracking our clients, or we tracked it before then, but we've got them on this handy dandy app here to show you that we do service um, clients in all 50 states, including Alaska and Hawaii. And so, you know, when we share information with you and we can say this is what we're seeing in the industry, it's because we have clients throughout the United States and um, they are in that critical access, working in the rural healthcare market, same as you, and understand that. So we do have that reach. We also have joined with Stroudwater Capital Partners. And with Stroudwater Capital Partners, um, they are our venture, our lending arm to help for capital projects that you may be interested in and just um, learning more about that. You're looking at, here's where the future is. We're gonna need a construction progress. How are we gonna pay for this? Stroudwater Capital Partner has connections with the USDA and working through that loan process while also understanding that rural market that you were in. And I highlighted some of the areas with both Stroudwater Capital Partners, but we have um, other areas within Stroudwater where we are just focused on serving you in your community and where you are. And we have a strategic advisory area as well as an operational advisory area. And so if you have any questions at all, feel free, reach out. Um, we just love chatting with those of you who are in the rural market 
and sharing what we've learned. You might have said that already, but you know what? I really do believe that. And so, again, I'm Amy Graham, and today what I am going to talk to you about, in addition to this groundwater stuff, is just pricing transparency. There's this legislation that's out there. Um, one of my friends, I and I will tell you, once we get to meet each other, I call you my friend, so I hope you like that. Uh, but one of my friends out there actually received a compliance letter, and um, we were a violation notice, and so we worked through that. And so we're just going to share those learnings with you. I'm going to start with just talking about pricing transparency, what it is, give you the tale for my small hospital, what they were doing, um, how to address this violation that they received, and then just share with you some key learnings related to that. So kicking that off, pricing transparency. Well, pricing transparency, what is that? Well, back in November 15, 2019, CMS finalized the current year 2020 hospital outpatient PPS policy changes and payment rates and ambulatory surgical center payment system policy changes and payment rates, pricing transparency requirements for hospitals to make standard public, make standard charges public. That CMS-1717-F2 dash dash because I couldn't make that all in one breath, we're just going to call that pricing transparency, if you don't mind. So that's the legislation that came out back in 2019. And it went into effect on January 1st, 2021. Yes, with all of the craziness that we all experienced as part of, price, of the pandemic, it still went into effect. And this information is required from all licensed hospitals in the United States. And what this legislation did is it provided price, it made accessible pricing information in two ways. The first way was a comprehensive machine readable file. And then the second way was in a display of shoppable services in a consumer friendly format. So there's this machine readable file and there's a consumer friendly format. And the both of those together make up pricing transparency. And when we talk about this consumer friendly format, that's shoppable services. So you may have heard another phrase, shoppable services being tossed out there, and that's all related to pricing transparency. Now, why am I talking about this? Because failure to comply with this legislation that went into effect on January 1st of 2021, failure to comply will result in a civil monetary penalty of $300 per day for hospitals with a bed count of 30 or fewer. And I will tell you, I'm going to tell you a story about one of my friends, but I've got five other friends who actually received violation notices as well that could have led to a penalty. So they pay attention. They are not ignoring critical access hospitals in this legislation. It impacts you all as well. You used to think back at the beginning in 2021, they'd be like, Amy, do they really care about the little guys? And I'm like, oh, it'll be you. They care about the little guys, and it's not just for the big hospital systems, but for everyone. So let's go talk about these two formats. My first format is this comprehensive machine readable file. Now, remember back in the day when you just had to post your charge master out there, you'd take your charge master, you'd download it on whatever file, and you'd post it on your website, right? Well, that is no longer, that does not meet the comprehensive machine readable file requirements. What you have to have is you have to have a file that includes all standard charges for all items and services for all hospital locations under a single hospital license. So think about it. Who all is under your license? All of those people are all of those locations. Their charges have to be under this in this con comprehensive machine readable file. It has to be posted on a publicly available website. Can't just be on your own internal website. It must be publicly available. It's easily accessible without barriers. So no big old logging in or anything easily accessible. Digitally searchable, updated at least once annually, and it follows the standard naming convention. So they tell you how to name it. They tell you that you've got to update it once a year. And they tell you these following data elements have to be included. But that's about all the guidance they give you on this machine readable file. So each of the data elements, you have to have a description of each item. Okay, that's easy. A discounted cash price. Ooh, do you have a cash price for your facility? 
And then it has to have payer specific negotiated charge. That's the charge that a hospital has negotiated with a third party payer for the item and services. And when they say charge, they're talking about your fee schedule amounts. So my question to you is when's last time you went looking for your fee schedules? Because you have to have that information on this comprehensive machine readable file. Then you also have to include the de-identified minimum negotiated charge and the de-identified maximum negotiated charge. So it's like the highest and the lowest charge that you would have for any of these services. And when they say charge, they mean reimbursement amount, not just your fee schedule amount, but or not just your charge rate, but how much you will be paid. And this strikes me as very interesting that they require you to give the payer specific information, and then you still have to give a de-identified minimum and maximum, but it was just identified. Okay, that's them, not me, but let's keep going with this. You also then have this shoppable services file. Now, what are shoppable services? Shoppable services are those items that people would shop for. They're going to price check. You know, it's like looking for a car. They're going to go around and say, where can I get the best value for my money, right? And CMS requires that this list have 300 items on it. So you're responsible for putting 300 items that your hospital provides on this list. But in addition, or in conjunction with those 300 items, CMS has said there are 70 items that are provided by that if they are or are not provided by the hospital, but there are these key 70 items that need to be included on that shoppable services list. And then, so you got 70 that are required to be on the list. You got to get to a total of 300, but there's 70 that your hospital provides. So you may actually, instead of having just an additional 230, you may have 250 additional shoppable services that you would include on your listing. And that's because of those 70 items, there are a few that you're not going to provide. Like one of them is an orthopedic orthopedic service. Your hospital doesn't include it, doesn't perform it, but you have to include it on the list. In addition to these shoppable services items that are chosen, you have to include the ancillary services connected with them. So one of the required CMS services that I'm pretty sure you do provide is a CT, or I'm, most of you would provide is the CT of your head with or without contrast. So think about that, that CT of your head with or without contrast, what are the ancillary services that go along with that? There's the CT, then you have the contrast, so you charge for the contrast, you might have a radiologist who is reading that procedure, right? Do you have any supplies that are attached to that service? Well, all of those charges connected with that one line of a CT exam must be included in your shoppable services file with the appropriate reimbursement amount. Again, it must include all locations operating under a single hospital license, must be publicly available on your website, easily accessible, digitally search searchable, updated at least once annually, keep that in mind. And they have given the option that if you offer a patient estimator tool, because some of you may offer a patient estimator, a patient could go in and get their estimate for their services back, that's an approved option out there. So the, those are your, those are your items that are, you know, available to you, or no, those are the items that are required to be on your shoppable services list. Now, in that shoppable services file, it does contain very similar items that are required that are contained on that comprehensive machine readable file. So there's the description of each item. There's the ancillary service in connected with those items with that service that you've picked. You have an indicator of CMS services that are not offered, a discounted cash price, payer specific negotiated rate a payer specific negotiated rate, the de-identified minimum and the de-identified maximum. And I just got a question and that question's a great question. Since our RHC operates under our tax ID, do you need to include RHC services? The answer is yes, you do need to include RHC services in this shoppable services list or it, 
for sure in the RH in the comprehensive machine readable file, yes, you need to include that lo that RHC location in your shoppable services file. You can use those RHC services to help you get to that total of 300 services because after a while you start looking at it going, do we even provide 300 services? We'll talk more about that here in a minute when I'll talk to you about my friends. So yes, the answer to that question is if your RHC operates under your license, they their information has to be included. And that is a challenge because you have your hospital file who's on one system and you have your RHC who could be on a totally different EHR system and may not even really have a charge master. All they have is a list of codes. That's gotta be included. You have to get that built into your comprehensive machine readable file. Now let's talk about this enforcement. You know, you got the, I'm like, you need to pay attention to this. You're going to have price transparency enforcement. They're gonna find you. But how does that all really work? Well, there were guidelines that were released on April 26, 2023. So just recently, they they strengthened or they um, became became stricter about how they were going to enforce the hospital transparency rule. So it's a stricter timeline, and they are levying files more quickly. So how that process works is you the first thing that happens is you get a notice of violation. Now that notice of violation is going to go to your CEO or your administrator. So if I'm talking to the revenue cycle or CFO people in the house, your, your administrator is going to get it and they're going to go, well, what's this? Why are we getting a violation notice? So just know that's who it's going to be addressed to or to let that person know if you get one of these, please pay attention to it, right? In that notice of violation, you have 90 day window to, to remediate it. So you get 90 days to fix whatever violation they tell you about. There's a corrective action plan. Now, if you don't remediate it, fix the notice of violation, it goes to the next level. That next level is a corrective action plan. Corrective action plan, you are given 45 days that you have to submit a corrective action plan, like it sounds, back to CMS to say, what you were going to fix and when you were going to fix it and how you're going to fix it. And so you, you take that information and then it tells you you've got to have those things fixed within 90 days of that correction of, of the notice of, of your corrective action plan violation letter. Now we'll say, notice this last button, if the hospital doesn't make any attempt to satisfy the requirement, they, if CMS goes out there and looks at your website and they don't see anything, they skip the notice of violation, go directly to a corrective action plan, and you get 45 days to submit a corrective action plan and 90 days to remediate the issue. So it's sort of like when we're playing Monopoly, do not pass go, go directly to jail. Okay, you're not going to jail, but you go directly to the corrective action plans. The, the corrective action plan stage of the violation notice. And after the corrective action plan comes the levying of fines. So that's how it works. Now, let me tell you about a tale from a small hospital. They're my friends, Allegheny Health, located in Sparta, North Carolina. So they're a 25 bed facility, critical access hospital, like y'all, right? They were using shop, they were posting their shoppable services using a free tool so they're like hey we got this tool they're looking at all our remit data pretty much pretty positive about that they're looking at our remit data and taking what we're charging off the remits and taking our services and posting them on this tool right but they couldn't find 300 tools like many of you they struggled to identify 300 unique shoppable services that were out there because they have limited volumes that are coming through their facility and limited services that are being provided. And they received a hospital price transparency warning notice from CMS saying they were non-compliant. More about this. Let's talk about this violation. You know, in that legislation we were talking about before, it actually says in that legislation, what CMS needs to look at to know to, to determine if you were in violation or not. So it gives you a lot of flexibility, but then they actually come back and go, and here's how we're gonna evaluate your compliance. They can either audit your hospital website, they evaluate complaints that are being made to CMS, 
or they can review individuals or entities analysis of noncompliance. So I've seen some websites out there. It's like, do you have, you know, is there a hospital that hasn't posted it? You can actually tell on them. You know what I'm saying? I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to leave that for a different conversation. Not one that I'm doing is this presentation. So my little friends, my, my little friends, my friends in Allegheny, they received a notice on a Tuesday in November stating that the review of their website had occurred on the previous Wednesday. Well, you know what was so unique about this is that Tuesday in November was the Tuesday after Thanksgiving and the, the review of the website site had occurred on the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So between Wednesday before Thanksgiving and Tuesday after Thanksgiving, CMS reviewed the website, issued the violation notice, sent it to the administrator at Allegheny. They got the violation notice. And when that notice came, the letter, it had the violation for not posting a comprehensive machine readable file. And it had a violation related to the display of shoppable services. Specifically, so it tells you in that violation what's wrong, specifically that no consumer-friendly list of standard charges was found. And they were given 90 days to remediate the violation. Now, this caused immediate concern. The first one was, who can help us? We get this pricing transparency notice. We've been working with this free service to give us the information. We've been trying to reach out to people, but nobody is helping us. Now we have a violation. Who can help us remediate this issue? And hello, we are the Tuesday after Thanksgiving. We are in the midst of the holiday season. Is 90 days going to be enough time to get this project complete? We've got to go pull fee schedules. And then let's, then we talk to the finance people and they're like, well, how much is this remediation going to cost? And then it was like, but if we don't do this, there is a $300 a day fine. Now that's some substantial cash for a critical access hospital. The $300 a day fine if we don't do this. And so immediately the finance people are calculating all the costs related to it. The, you know, it, the team's like, how can we do this? So when the, what they did is we started thinking about how can they address the violation notice? Because you know what? These violation notices are pretty scary. So what Allegheny did is they, the first step they did is they reached out to a partner. So they called me and said, hey, do you know anybody familiar with pricing transparency? And you all know our charge master. We've been working on a charge master project. So do you know anybody that can help us out? And I'm like, I am very familiar with price transparency. Let me help you out. What does your service look like? So we started working on just identifying what they were currently using. We also connected with the Office of Rural Health because they're like, how much is it going to cost? I can't worry about how much it's going to cost because I've got this violation, but how much is it going to cost? Who, you know, are there any resources at the state level? So we connected them with the North Carolina Office of Rural Health, and the North Carolina Office of Rural Health said we can help support you in this project, and so just partnered with the Office of Rural Health. And that's what I would say to those of you um, that I'm talking to today. Don't forget you have this resource at your Office of Rural Health that may or may not be able to to support you in it, but it's worth a try to ask. Then they formed an internal task force to just say, we've got to get this done. We have 90 days. I realize we're in the middle of these holidays, but we've got to get it done. And we need to acknowledge that a one size fits most model did not fit my facility. It didn't make it because we've got this in the notice of violation. And then all together, what we did is we started working on a compliant offering. What is that compliant offering that we can give? So here's what happened. We created the offering. We started first on the shoppable services piece where we identified the 300 total services for inclusion on the list. And we were used the hospital and clinic charge masters to do that. We worked together, pulling that information. Then what we did is we engaged the clinical team for helping us identify those ancillary services because the question came up, 
we have this CT with CT with contrast. Do we charge for that contrast or not? It's on our charge master, but do we charge for it? So having to engage that team to see, yes, we did charge for it. Here's the charge code that was used. Here's the price associated with it. Then what we did while all of this is going on is we analyzed the payer contracts. I'm gonna ask it, I asked it a minute ago. Do you know where your fee schedules are for your payer contracts? Because that information has to be included in both the shoppable services offering and the comprehensive machine readable file. And then together we developed an Excel model that could be posted on Allegheny's website. It's posted out there today. You can go and look at it if you want to, but pay attention to our webinars first. You can do that afterwards. So anyway, then what we did is we leveraged the information that we pulled in the shoppable services offering and created the comprehensive machine readable file. So we didn't have to go pull the payer contracts again because we had already done that. We didn't need to identify the ancillary services that would be provided because they were part of the entire charge master. But we had already pulled the hospital and the clinic's charge master for inclusion on this list. And then it, we developed a CSV file to be posted on Allegheny's website. And I am pleased to say that we completed and posted both of these files in under 60 days from the date of notification. So in the midst of all of the holiday hoopla going on, we were able to get this done in under 60 days from the notification. And then we got done and it was like, well, what do we do now? What does the letter say? And the letter was silent. So what we realized is that we had to wait for the Stealth Ninja at CMS to return and review, our review their website again. So the hospital waited. There was no one we could tell we were done. We just knew that we were done, but we had to wait. And March 2023, 90 days from the first notice, CMS performed a second review of the Allegheny website, and they determined that the hospital remained noncompliant. I was crushed. I was so crushed. I'm like, what? What did we not do? And the violation that they found was that somehow we had managed to leave off the room and board charges. So it had to include room and board charges. And think about it. When you run your, when you run your charge master, are there lines for room and board? Or are those picked up somewhere else within a different part of the system? They have to be included on your charge master. And then the other violation on this comprehensive machine readable file was that there was a failure to follow the standard naming convention specified by CMS. We had put the MPI number or the hospital had put the MPI number and the hospital name and just posted it out there, right? No, CMS wanted your EIN underscore hospital name underscore standard charges dot and the file format. There were no violations identified on the shoppable services file. Sweet. So we knew that the shoppable services had passed it, but we had to address the comprehensive machine readable file. And on that violate on that corrective action plan, second notice of violation, they were given 45 days that they had to complete the corrective action plan. So Allegheny made the required updates completed the corrective action plan and submitted it within three days. So within three days, we had it all done. And you had a website that you would send your corrective action plan off to, but how do we know we did it right? Guess what? We had to wait for a stealth ninja to return again from the CMS and do that review in the background. And they reviewed it within 30 days and did issue a compliance notice. So they had done the review to, to see that the website was in compliance and that it was um, ready to go and that they sent a notice of compliance to us. Well, actually, they sent it to the hospital, but by that time, I just felt like I was part of them, too, because we were all just making sure that we were in compliance with this. So some of our key learnings that are out there. The number one is that this isn't just meant for your large institutions. This isn't meant for just the Mayo Clinic or um, some of those other large facilities that you see out there. Mayo was the first one that came to mind. It was, it is meant for your rural and critical access hospitals. 
comprehensive machine readable file, the other key learning out of this is that your comprehensive machine readable file and shoppable services file, they contain the same similar information, but not the same information. So it's similar, but unique that you can't just post the same file twice under two different names and, and think that you are done. You must have two pieces of inf you must have those two separate files out there. And then by, and then next, CMS. Oh my goodness. This is the one that I thought was just that is crazy, right? They give you so much flexibility related to this project. So much flexibility. And yet they are critical about how the standard naming convention is. It just makes me think, really, you give us so much flexibility, but then the standard naming convention is where you're going to issue me a notice of violation. Is that correct? Yes, Amy, that is correct. And the other thing, too, the last, the emission of the last review date. One of my friends, you know how I told you that I've got at least five friends out there who have received these violation notices? One of them got it because I'm like, wait, you've got it posted. I know I, I, I've seen it on your website. When we went and looked at their website, what we realized is that the last update date was January of 2022. And we were in March of 2023. So 12 months had passed, 12 months, actually it's 14 months had passed and they were in violation because they required that that is done. And then the final key learning out of this is just to realize that you don't have to solve this alone. You, There are resources out there who have been down this road and more than happy to, you know, if you want to call me and be like, hey, Amy, can you look at our offering? What do you see? You've been through this violation, you know, what do we need to do about that? More than happy to do that. You don't have to solve it alone. Sometimes when you're in your community, you're thinking, I've got nobody to talk to about this. I'm here more than happy to talk to you about it. You know, I'm sure you could reach out to Allegheny and just ask them and be like, hey, can you help us understand what we need to do about this? So that, those are my questions. You know, those are just key learnings to have to remember out there what we need to do. Now, we'll pause for a minute and see if anybody has any other questions that they want to ask about this to just say, who, you know, what about this? What do I need to do? I got the first one. Let me see. Oh, I've got a second one. So the second one that came through was asking me, Amy, if a hospital submits this information and then you get somebody on the phone at CMS and they tell you it's okay, is that really okay? My answer to you is I would still wait for the letter of full compliance to come back from CMS to let you know that you are in compliance because CMS will issue you a letter that says you are in compliance as of this point in time when we reviewed your services. So just letting you know that yes, um, you will get a letter back. Yes, a verbal okay is okay. However, I would wait for it to be in writing before I felt like I was done with that. Any other questions? So I have included as part of my presentation, and it will be sent out to everybody after this, just the list of the 70 specified CMS specified shoppable services items. So you can see that some of these like a basic metabolic panel, you all do offer that, right? Um, that's one of the items that's required. But then we get down here to these medicine and surgery services like cardiac valve and major cardiothoracic procedures or a spinal fusion. I'm pretty sure that the majority of you are not offering these services at your hospital. You could be. I'm not saying you can't. But that's one of the items that if you don't offer that service, you need to make sure that you've put something in its place, that you list this one 
is not offered at your facility, but then you add an additional one um, to your list. So say you had all of the 70 except for this uh, cervical spinal fusion, um, then that one you don't do, then your list would have 301 items on it. And then there are additional medical and surgical services that are there. Things to keep in mind, some of your services may not be listed on your charge master because they're coded in your HIM department. So you need to make sure that you are picking that information up. So with that, I just want to say thank you so much for your time today, for letting me just talk to you about pricing transparency. You can tell I really like talking about it. Um, and just want to say I do value the time that you've shared with me. And uh, thank you for attending today. And now I am actually going to hand it over to my colleague, Wade. Wade, are you out there? I hey, Wade. Wade's going to, Wade's, there. yeah. Oh, sorry for interrupting you, Wade. Wade's going to talk to us now about cost reporting. And if you've ever heard me talk about charge masters, you know that I'm going to leverage cost reporting and bring Wade into the conversation too, because those two items go hand in hand. So, Wade, at this point, I'm going to stop sharing and let you take over. And thanks for, thanks for joining the call, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. And it's great to, to chat, as Amy mentioned, you know, we work together fairly frequently to talk about, you know, the intersection between revenue cycle and the cost report. There's definitely a lot of um, uh, touch points there. And so uh, good, to, good to really hear about pricing transparency and, and some of the um, other revenue cycle items impacting the cost report. Um, so today we're going to jump into a cost report best practices presentation. Um, this is going to be a high level review of what we consider best practices for cost report preparation and review and then opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater. We are working with a number of critical access hospitals across the country to identify opportunities in the cost report, look at it from um, a holistic viewpoint with an operational lens and really get a sense of, you know, what are the opportunities here for the hospital based on their Medicare cost report. So um, as far as an agenda, we're really gonna cover three major areas. Um, we're gonna talk about critical access hospital reimbursement for just a brief moment. Then we're gonna jump into some of the best practices and some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see when we're reviewing cost reports. Now, I definitely want to preface everything and, and say that anything we're gonna talk about today there's always a, a there's a grain of salt somewhere, or at least there generally is. And you know, I think back to when I was taking tax classes and, and trying to get ready for you know the CPA exam review. I remember there was a um, very fitting description of of tax, saying that you know we have this general principle, but there is always some sort of exception to that general principle. Um, and I think it's very similar too with Medicare reimbursement, specifically cost based reimbursement in the Medicare cost report. There are a whole host of nuances, um, and there's not a significant amount of really good educational material out there on the Medicare cost report and its importance, as well as how to maximize. So there's just a lot of information there, so we can, we're going to touch on that a bit, but keep in mind that there's, there's generally some form of nuance in what we're going to talk about, so bear with me. Just to start with the end in mind, really, is what we're attempting to do here. So Cost-based reimbursement is a mechanism by which critical access hospitals are reimbursed from Medicare and in some states Medicaid or some variation of cost-based reimbursement in some cases. It all depends. So um, you, you likely know what your state does. Um, and so why the Medicare cost report is important is because it helps us calculate our cost-based rate going forward. So when you file your Medicare cost report with your Medicare administrative contractor, formerly known as a fiscal intermediary, um, they, they will review your cost report. They're going to make sure that it's acceptable. So they go through this whole list of checks and balances to make sure that things look accurate. And then they're, if they accept your cost report, there might be a tentative settlement of some kind, but then they're going to utilize that data, that information and the rates contained in that um, to set your rates going forward until they receive another cost report from you, um, which will go over certain circumstances where that would happen. But we're filing these cost reports usually on an annual basis. Um, so at least that point, 
So it's fundamental that we look to maximize our cost-based reimbursement by reviewing the cost report because cost-based reimbursement really helps our, our hospitals, the ones especially with lower, lower volumes. It can act as a safety net of sorts. It partially insulates the hospitals from those financial impacts, at least again, for our cost-based payers. Um, and it helps hospitals. That's why we see so many critical access hospitals in very rural parts of the country is because it helps in situations with inherently low populations, low volumes. It gives some advantages too, in terms of cash flow. The cost-based reimbursement also doesn't protect a hospital from all financial woes. That being said, cost report maximization is an important thing for critical access hospitals to do to maximize their cost-based reimbursement. So jumping into the best practices, it is really tough to um, come up with a comprehensive list of best practices for cost report preparation and review. It could be done, but there, as I mentioned before, are so many nuances to it that it becomes a very challenging exercise to try and capture everything. As such, we did not attempt to in this best practices section. What we wanted to do here is really look at some of the core principles behind the cost report and then talk about best practices through the lens of those core principles. So we have four of them here, you know, review of mappings, we'll talk about that, overhead cost allocations, um, settlement tracking, and then cost report reviews. Um, those are overarching terms. They're not mutually exclusive. They, they often are related to each other in some way. So we're gonna look at those in a little bit more detail. So when we say our mappings, right, we are, there's, there's a number of different things that might come to mind, especially from a cost report preparation standpoint. But one of the important aspects of proper cost report preparation is understanding that there is a matching principle. So when I say matching, um, if you've been in reimbursement or taken accounting classes, we wanna make sure that we're matching our expenses and revenues so that we can accurately calculate our, our reimbursement on the cost report. Without proper matching, it is very possible that we have inaccurate reimbursement, or at least reimbursement that is skewed a bit, and we'll likely have some misstatements there. Now, the hospitals generally will utilize various forms of documentation to perform mapping on their cost report. So again, we're talking about our worksheet A, worksheet C, we're worksheet D series, we're talking about Medicare charges. So there are these different worksheets in there where we have to map our expenses and make sure they're consistent throughout the cost report. Um, so that way, if we look at our revenues on one end and then our expenses on the other, we can see they're appropriately matched. Um, hospitals will generally use a trial balance, revenue detail file. Sometimes it'll be detailed to a charge code level. Other times it might just be by revenue code, which is similar to the Medicare PSNR. Um, a lot of hospitals do utilize the Medicare PSNR, which is the Provider Statistical and Reimbursement Report, um, which provides a breakdown of Medicare utilization information. So it, it provides charges and units and days and discharges um, for Medicare and um, managed care as well, inpatient, outpatient. So it provides us with this host of data and often hospitals will utilize this, although some do utilize their own internal data for Medicare mapping. But what we really see as best practice here is ensuring we're reviewing the way that we're mapping our you know, trial balance accounts. Again, expenses, revenues. Are we mapping those appropriately? Are we mapping our Medicare charges appropriately? The cost report is driven by what's referred to as cost centers. So these are essentially departments of the hospital. And so when we're, when we're looking to map these accounts, these, um, these re the revenues, the expenses, um, we really have to refer to that cost center structure. So the reason why we put best practice of reviewing these at least annually is because it can be easy at the end of the year to and I know the cost report is coming up, right? So we know it's going to, to be a huge deal. We might review um, things and kind of try and, and work to cram in our cost report prep in those five months after your fiscal year end to try and get it done. And it's often a huge exercise. 
takes a lot of effort, whether you prepare it internally or whether you utilize um, kind of an outsourced um, company who helps you with that, who utilize a local accounting firm. Either way, it's a substantial amount of work. And um, it's really important that we make sure that in the craziness of preparing that cost report that we are looking at things through an objective lens a little bit, kind of stepping back and saying, do these make sense? We put at least annually because sometimes hospitals do have to file more than one time during a year. There's any number of, of times where that might come up. Maybe there's a you know, change of ownership. Maybe there are other changes that occur within the organization. Um, maybe you have certain a site close or, or, or open. Or there are any number of situations in which you might have to file additional cost reports. Um, so it's really important to review when you're filing cost reports and also throughout the year. Who knows what's going to it's going to be added to your trial balance, right? It's important to understand that. But this is considered best practice. Overhead cost allocations. So when the cost report is looking at your total costs, they look at it in a number of different ways. One of the ways that they delineate costs is they dedicate some to overhead cost centers. So this would be, you know, your maintenance and repairs, your dietary expense, your depreciation, other capital costs. A um, number of different overhead departments that then need to be, sometimes it's referred to as stepped down, or what essentially means is allocated to the non-overhead departments within your hospital, including what's referred to as non-reimbursable cost centers. And so the potential issue that we see here at Stroudwater, um, and even in you know a prior life, you know I, I worked at a Medicare administrative contractor, and then on the provider side for a while is you, the, the risk or the potential issue is that you will have overhead cost allocations that don't reflect or don't accurately reflect the actual overhead resource use for a department. Um, we see oftentimes cost allocation methods that don't really intuitively make sense. And the issue there is that it can have an impact on your reimbursement, either positively or negatively. Um, the, the other potential issue is that, and I say issue uh, a bit lightly, it's not an issue necessarily, but Medicare has prescribed cost allocation methodologies that are built into the cost report. So if you were to look at your you know, maintenance department or your dietary department, um, your capital cost centers, there are certain prescribed methodologies that are baked into the cost report. Um, and many times it's easy to just kind of you know, utilize those not really look into other methodologies because it takes some work. Um, it's a prescribed method. You won't run into any issues, hopefully, with the Medicare administrative contractor when you file your cost report. But the challenge here is that we often encounter times where it's all there seems to be a lack of awareness that it is possible to adjust these methodologies if it's deemed to be more favorable or more accurate. So you are able to work with your local Medicare administrative contractor. There is a formal process that you would uh, utilize if you wanted to do this, but it's, it's, it's important that we consider this um, because we want our cost allocations to accurately reflect our overhead use. Um, because at the end of the day, again, our costs, the way our costs are going into these different buckets determines what we're gonna be reimbursed um, by Medicare for. So the best practice we have is really reviewing these at least annually. Um, I, I would recommend probably more frequently, maybe at least twice a year, uh, because our overhead cost, cost allocations can be impacted by so many different changes in our um, just our hospital operations. A good example of this is our capital costs, right? Our capital costs can be impacted if we switch one department's or one department um, with another department in the hospital, or maybe we are expanding the hospital and we create a new wing, or we uh, obtain some new office space that we then move some of the administrative folks into. Um, there's any number of reasons why our, our cost allocations could change. And so it's really important that we monitor these more than just once a year, more than just at the end of the year, to really make sure that we're, we're tracking where we need to be. Tracking the settlement, I think that this is 
a very high level best practice and it incorporates what we just talked about, right? As I mentioned before, the best practices we have here are not mutually exclusive. They feed off each other, they're uh, ingrained into each other. So the, the Medicare cost report is a mechanism by which our rates are set for Medicare um, and Medicare Advantage if you're filing with your MA payers. Um, so traditionally, Medicare will settle with, um, with hospitals each year. And because our settlement, so very similar to our tax returns, right? We have on an individual basis, we have the amount of taxes that we paid throughout the year. We have the taxes that we were supposed to pay as calculated in our annual tax return. Um, it's very similar for hospitals with the Medicare program. So the, Medi the Medicare cost report is like the, the tax return and it shows whether or not Medicare throughout the year paid you um, what needed to be paid. So they will make interim payments again, based on your last cost report. And then when you file a new cost report, they're going to settle up. They're gonna take what you were paid throughout the year compared to what you were owed based on the cost report and then issue you a settlement at the end of the year. It could be an amount due to the hospital. It could be an amount due to the program, to the Medicare program. Um, and it's really important that we maintain you know, financial prudence and have some sort of understanding of what that's going to be at, the, at year end. Um, what's the issue here is that because we have a reimbursement mechanism, cost-based reimbursement, that is, is kind of fluctuating, right? It fluctuates throughout the year. A lot of critical access hospital, hospitals we've worked with experience significant cost inflation in the past couple of years. Sometimes it happened midway through their fiscal year. Sometimes it happened at the end. But because of the changes in our cost structure, even in a given month or given few months, the settlement amount or the amount we can expect to receive from Medicare is a moving target, right? Um, it requires continual monitoring because we don't want there to be surprises at year end. That's a potential issue. If we don't know what we're anticipating to receive from Medicare and our other cost-based payers at year end, then that is a, that is a challenge. Um, and some, some might say, well, if it's an amount due at the end of the year that's significant, um, as in the hospital will receive a large sum of money, then that's a good surprise, right? That's kind of one of the good, good surprises. If we, if we file our cost report, we don't have any idea, and then we end up getting money back from Medicare, that's a good thing compared to the opposite, right, where we owe Medicare money. And I think that that's, that is a true statement. However, um, the challenge that we often see is that if you are not expecting or if you don't expect a settlement at the year end and it's significant, it's a really large sum of money, then what that really means is that we missed out on cash flow throughout the year. If we had filed, say, an interim cost report and it had been accepted by the MAC and settled, then we would have experienced some of that um, benefit uh, earlier on, and therefore we could have put that money to use in areas sooner. So either way, we really don't want to have surprises, and we want to seek to to know that if we are expecting a significant amount from Medicare, we wanna see if we can get an interim cost report filed, right? There's an additional component to this too, where even though our Medicare, you know, traditional Medicare will settle up at the end of each year, again, just comparing what they paid you to what you were owed and then issuing a settlement, a lot of the MA plans or Medicare Advantage plans don't follow the same process. Now, Medicare Advantage plans are supposed to pay you according to Medicare rates, Again, unless there's some sort of direct contracting going on. So if we have a situation in which we are, we are watching our settlement throughout the year, we're tracking our costs, we're tracking our revenues, we're mapping things, we're dealing with our overhead cost allocations, and we're expecting to see a significant um, receivable from Medicare, and a significant amount due to us at the end of the year, we should be looking at the cost report and saying, hey, we want to get these rates over to our Medicare Advantage plans as soon as possible because we, according to the cost report, we're being underpaid right now. So it's really important, and that's a potential issue too, is that hospitals can lose out on reimbursement if they're not filing with their Medicare Advantage plans and monitoring their settlement throughout the year. So the best practice here is really 
monitoring your cost report settlement throughout the year um, using a, a valid model to estimate that. We've seen everything from you know, sophisticated models. You can, you can purchase these. A lot of the times, um, local accounting firms who help prepare cost reports can help you with this. Um, you might develop something internally where you can monitor your costs and kind of mimic the way the cost report calculates your settlement. Um, there's any number of options here, but it's really important that we monitor this throughout the year and use it, again, to my initial point, to maintain um, financial management. We can have an expected amount due to or from Medicare and our other cost-based payers that's on our books that we, we are tracking. And then also keeping in mind that there is opportunity, especially if we are seeing underpayments really throughout the year, to maybe get another cost report filed, an interim cost report, which we can then get over to our Medicare Advantage plans as well. So there's a lot of uh, opportunity there. So the best practice is really monitoring that throughout the year. And then cost report reviews, again, a very high level term. It's, it's, it encompasses a lot, but assuming we're doing the, the other three best practices, right? So we have really thought through our mappings, through our overhead cost allocations. We have a good sense of our settlement throughout the year. The, the next step in that equation is really looking at it and saying, does this make sense? Does this pass the smell test? Um, it's really important to um, have objective reviews, to have a multi-tiered review process, whether it's internal or external of your Medicare cost report. And in this, we say before filing, it's really important that that occurs. You know, it's, it's definitely not best practice to, you know, once the year end rolls around, we kind of scramble, we put on a mad scramble to get everything done. And we don't really look at it from an, from an objective perspective, right? The cost report is incredibly complex and there are a number of calculations that occur in there. I know it says hundreds, it might be thousands. I haven't gone through and looked at each of the calculations and kind of tabulated that information, but there's a lot. There's a lot of calculations that go on and there's so many ties to regulatory references. It's just, it's a very complex document. And because of this, there are plenty of opportunities for errors and inconsistencies and even just missed opportunities for additional reimbursement. Um, Generally, if you're preparing a cost report, they offer different software packages that can help you do it, unless you really desire to do it by hands, the old school way where it, it's, that's, that's another option as well. But generally speaking, providers and, you know, cost report preparers who might be in, you know, public accounting or, or other firms, they utilize some form of software to help them prepare the cost report. Um, those help to an extent they might help you take care of some of the immediately glaring errors, the things that your Mac will look at your cost report and say, yeah, we're not gonna accept this. There's a lot of, of software that can help you recognize that component, but there's, there's no software that I'm aware of that'll help you go through and analyze your cost report and say, well, this is a missed opportunity here, um, or you have an opportunity to pick up some additional reimbursement here. It, there's just a number of areas for, for risk there. So that's the best practice is really to have a multi-tiered reviewing process um, when you're preparing the cost report and even having something after you file, getting an objective set of eyes on it to see if there are any opportunities that may have been missed. So I, I like this slide. This is a worksheet S. So the, the front page of your Medicare cost report, this is what's gonna show up. Not these exact numbers, but this is the format it's gonna be presented in. And I think it's really interesting. They have a whole paragraph down at the bottom um, with some information, but one sentence really stands out and that's the time to complete and review the information in this document is estimated at about 674 hours, uh, which is a lot of time. And, and I would look to the cost report, you know, preparers or those who have, have experience in that to make their own decisions around the accuracy of that statement. but Either way, the cost report is a, a very substantial document. It takes a lot of time to put together. It takes coordination throughout the hospital. You can't do it in isolation. Um, 
And on top of that, it, another part that I didn't include here, but that's worth noting is that on the same page, if you scroll up just a little bit, there's going to be a signature line for the hospital. And this is going to be a signature signing off on the accuracy of the cost report. So whoever it is, maybe it's the CFO or the CEO or some other um, leader in the hospital. It's generally somebody in the hospital, but they are signing off on the document and saying, we attest to the accuracy of this report. We, we, we are, we're attesting to that. We're putting our name behind it. Um, and it is a federal document. So it's just really important that we take that seriously and uh, that we implement these best practices to make sure we're filing something that's as accurate as possible. All right, so now that we have kind of gone through the, the best practices, we're gonna jump into some of the common reimbursement opportunities that we see here at Stroudwater. As I mentioned before, it's not an all-encompassing list. It is a, a handful that we've noticed. There are plenty of other opportunities that we see when we're reviewing cost reports with critical access hospitals. Um, so we're just gonna touch on some of those now. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to put them in the chat box if you would like to, um, to do that. We are monitoring that and so we can answer questions as they come in. The five that we chose to focus on in this presentation were you know, Medicare bad debts, overhead cost allocation statistics, related party costs, uh, physician standby costs in the ED, and then rural health clinic uh, provider FTE counts, although we, we do talk about just accurately reporting on our rural health clinics in general. All right, the first one, one that is near and dear to my heart. So it, a little, little background here. So I used to work for a Medicare administrative contractor. And as part of that, we would, we would review and we would audit Medicare cost reports, right? So we would be kind of on the other end of that. I, I think we have a large contingency of providers on, on this presentation. And so I apologize to anybody who I might under that um, time at the MAC might have looked at your bad debts and, and potentially disallowed some. Um, it's, it's a very big area of opportunity for hospitals we find, but it's also an area of increasing scrutiny uh, from the Medicare administrative contractors. So what Medicare bad debts, what, what is that? Um, these are the deductible and coinsurance amounts related to Medicare patients that remain unpaid as of a certain point in time. So the, these can be claimed as an allowable cost on the Medicare cost report. And what happens is when you present a total on the cost report, it'll reimburse you for 65% of that total. So that's just the, the method that's used. Um, the, the amount that has been reimbursed has declined historically. So at one point in time, it was higher than 65% reimbursement. On those bad debts, it has dropped to 65%. Um, and I don't know if, if it will be dropping further in, in the future, um, but you get to be reimbursed a portion of that at least. So why is that important? Generally speaking, critical access hospitals have a fairly substantial amount of potential Medicare bad debt that doesn't get claimed on the cost report. And the reason it doesn't get claimed is because it's, it can be challenging to put in numbers that are substantiated by documentation, where you have a valid bad debt listing, where you, you are able to get bad debts back from a collection agency if you utilize a collection agency, which many critical access hospitals do, uh, really many hospitals in general do that. There are all these different requirements in order for you to claim those Medicare bad debts on your cost report. And whether it's because of, of challenges meeting those requirements or even just a lack of, of understanding of how those get reimbursed, um, we often see that there's opportunity for hospitals to claim more. When we're looking at hospital cost reports, we use roughly 10% of deductible and coinsurance amounts as a barometer to see where a hospital is that isn't uh, if you're under the 10%, that doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. And if you're over the 10%, that doesn't mean you're doing anything far better. It just means we use that as a as kind of a, 
our SNP test to see are we are we somewhere in that range? And if not, why are we not in that range? Um, there are nuances by state with this as well. So it certainly depends on, on your state. Um, but the opportunity really is to make sure that we are, you know, maintaining adequate documentation, that we're properly preparing these, that we're pulling back bad debts after a reasonable collection effort has been um, made from our collection agencies. That's been a big one. Uh, you know, I've mentioned that a few times because that's a huge area where you can have your Medicare bad debts denied because you have an account that's still out with collections, even though you've written it off in your accounting system as a bad debt. There's a lot of, a lot of confusion around that as well. Just because you put something as bad debt in your internal system doesn't mean it automatically qualifies to be reimbursed by Medicare. You have to go through a number of other tests to make sure. So there's all these different things that can get in the way of that. This is just an example. This shows on the Medicare cost report where you're gonna find these bad debts reported. It's just a few lines. This is looking at worksheet E-3 part, part five. And so this is showing an allowable bad debt total in line 25. Line 26 just represents line 25 multiplied by 65%. And then line 27 is your dual eligible bad debts. And the reason I, I bring this up is because uh, one bad debt is not the exact same as another bad debt. Um, they are treated differently. And it's, it's important for our critical access hospital operators to be aware of this, that you have different types of bad debts. And when, they're, when the cost report is being audited, they are going to look at those differently. Um, so your dual eligibles are just your Medicare and Medicaid dual eligible um, bad debts. Similarly, for the outpatient side of the house, we have it on E part B, very similar principle. Um, it's just these few, few small amount of lines on the cost report in general, um, but this is a really important piece because it is looked at very frequently. So what is the solution? The solution here is really to make sure that our bad debts are properly tracked, that we're, we're working with our collection agencies. If you've had, and this has happened a number of times I've seen where providers have had bad debts that have been sitting with a collection agency for years, potentially. And if they were to have pulled those back from collections, they, at least for the Medicare component, they would have been reimbursed at least 65% for those. But then you, you run into issues where, you know, maybe there's refilings that need to take place or depending upon when the bad debt was actually brought back from the collection agency, that creates some challenges. So the solution is really making sure we're tracking these accurately, that we're understanding um, when these need to be claimed. It's not like if you have completed all your collection efforts in one year, and then you realize that there were some bad debts that you didn't claim in that year. It's not like you can just put those on your new cost report, right? You kind of have to, you have to work with your Mac um, and refile in some cases, but it's just really important for us to be aware of this because there is reimbursement there for that. Um, and again, proper documentation is a key component of this as well. Overhead cost allocations. I won't spend a ton of time on this because we already talked about the importance in the best practice section. All I would really reiterate here is that the, the principle here, if you look in the Code of Federal Regulations, it says we need to have a method of cost finding this cost allocation. Um, we really need to make sure that our costs are properly allocated. Again, our overhead cost allocations are allocated based on a certain method, and there are opportunities for us to utilize different methods. Um, one area that we see fairly frequently is in our medical records cost allocation, where we see a number of critical access hospitals that use gross charges as a cost allocation methodology. Um, this is done because, again, it's a prescribed kind of CMS cost allocation method, and it's relatively easy to generate, right? So the cost report, depending upon what you're using, it might allow you to automatically reference, say, your worksheet C, where it already populates your gross charges. So it's a very easy statistic, a very easy way to allocate your costs. But we often find that gross charges really don't have anything to do with the actual time spent by our medical records folks. 
in a given department or for a specific specific bill or for coding um, uh, on a claim, we really don't we don't see that correlation. And often when we we think about other alternative methodologies, it can actually increase our reimbursement because we have more cost going into higher cost based buckets on the cost report. That's just one example. We see a number of different additional opportunities, you know, times when hospitals are double counting costs or excluding certain costs, and it all, it all impacts our reimbursement. I did not include the worksheet B-1 or, or worksheet B part one, B part two, because they're a bit of a bear to look at on a single screen. Um, but if you're, if you want to talk more about this, we can look into that. Um, but so again, the solution is really making sure that we have a good basis for our cost allocations, making sure we're reviewing them on at least an annual basis, looking at you know, things like double counting, um, direct costing, what are we direct costing to different departments, um, and then really working with your cost report preparer and the local MAC if you think that there's an alternate methodology that might be more favorable or if you want to look at changing some of these, there is an opportunity. And again, there are certain restrictions. There's some nuance to that, but it is important for everybody to be aware that there are opportunities. It's not like you are mandated and you cannot look into changing those cost allocation methodologies. So, all right, related party cost. This is a really interesting one and has become more and more prominent as critical access hospitals have uh, affiliated with larger systems or they have management agreements set up they have become more and more um, ingrained in the, the health system structure, a lot of you know, murders going on, a lot of changes in that way. So what are we doing? So when you are a hospital and you receive services from another related party organization, you know, common ownership or control, you are able to include allowable cost based on the cost to the related party organization. Generally, what we see is critical access hospitals who are within a larger system, and they have a home office cost, cost statement set up. So the home office represents some of the corporate um, administrative, largely administrative costs. And what happens is the, the system sets up this cost statement, this home office cost statement, which allocates a portion of all of that cost based on a number of different methodologies to all of its affiliates, to the organizations within that system. Why is this important? Well, we see significant variation in the treatment of these related party costs, but really the, the challenge here is we, we want our health systems to be aware of cost-based reimbursement, right? So if we have greater costs going to a critical access hospital and we compare that to, you know, again, the amount that the critical access hospital has uh, transferred to that to that home office to that to that healthcare facility. If we are able to maximize that, then we can maximize our cost based reimbursement. Um, but it's it's often challenging to to communicate that. Um, larger systems tend to be you know have different departments that are are kind of separated out, and the critical access hospitals might not always have kind of the inside scoop on how those allocations are happening. But it's really important that we make sure we are looking to optimize this because it can result in additional reimbursement. And having that understanding, it might change the way we're doing some of these home office cost allocations. Uh, so the solution, again, is just partnering with your related party organization, helping them out to understand the impact based on cost-based cost -based reimbursement to your rates as a critical access hospital and partnering with them on this, seeing if you can come up with a methodology that makes more sense. This is an example here. So this would all play out on your worksheet A-8-1. And if you have a greater amount of allowable cost in column four to what you have paid out, again, it could be in the form of a, an intercompany transaction, something like that. You compare those two and you will get um, whatever the difference is between the amount you've paid out and the allowable cost is what the adjustment is going to be. So if the allowable cost, the cost that's allocated based on the home office methodology is greater 
than what's reflected on your trial balance, then you will have a positive adjustment to your cost report and thus your rates will be enhanced. So again, big area of opportunity. The next one we have is our physician standby non-call costs in the ED. Again, when so when the general principle, when we have physicians in our emergency department um, who are, are there, but they are not treating patients, right? So they're engaged in some form of, of other activity, not patient care. The cost report will look at that in on your worksheet A-8-2 will treat that as allowable cost. Um, and the idea being if they're seeing patient care that's reimbursed under Part B, if it's the, the, other, the other time, then it is reimbursed on the cost report, the Part A component. Um, so the, the opportunity we often find is that hospitals aren't accurately tracking the time their providers are spending on patient care in the ED. Um, when we go and we do, there are some high-level calculations you can do on the cost report to get a sense of the amount of patient care time per ED visit. And we often find that, you know, when we do this calculation, we're seeing the, that uh, emergency department physician spent, you know, 50, 60, 70 minutes per, per patient, which is generally pretty high um, and wouldn't be expected. But that what that means is that you're overstating the time that is not, or the cost that is not reimbursed on the cost report. So again, the more time we can put into this administrative, this non-patient time bucket, the, the greater our cost report uh, reimbursement will be. The solution to this is to, it's easier said than done. There are a number of electronic time tracking uh, methods that are available. And there's also time studies. Now, the bigger challenge that we found, um, and in my experience is helping um, hospitals and providers see the need for this and, and why it's beneficial to the hospital. And if you're able to share that, hey, we, we estimate that there's a potential pickup in reimbursement, then that can potentially help to offset it, right? Because generally when you talk about time studies, the, the question comes up, well, why are we doing this and what, what's the need here? Um, and there's, um, there's a skepticism with that, but it's important to emphasize that it, it's, not, it's not a productivity metric as much as it is a method for ensuring we maximize our reimbursement on the cost report. And again, just an example of your worksheet A-8-2 where this will play out. And the last opportunity we see is, is in our provider-based rural health clinics. So if you have a provider-based rural health clinic, there's a lot of nuance to this, especially with you know, recent changes to how these RHCs are, are reimbursed depending upon when they were they were formalized. Um, but generally speaking, if you've had a provider-based RHC, you're paid a certain amount um, per visit, you're, you've got an all-inclusive rate. And there are productivity standards to that. So if you have, depending upon your FTE count of providers in that RHC, the cost report will calculate a productivity standard translated to a number of visits. And so if the actual visits claimed on the cost report are less than this productivity standard, cost report will use that standard to calculate your, your all-inclusive rate, your rate per visit. Now, why is this is challenging is because the opportunity we see is not so much always that the providers are not in line with the productivity standards, but it's more that we're not accurately um, reporting the FTEs. So we want to make sure we're only including FTEs related to uh, RHC services as defined in the regs. We, we wanna make sure we're excluding non-RHC services from that, that FTE count, because what that'll do is it'll reduce that productivity standard to make it more in line with what our actual productivity is. Just an illustration here, and I know we've only got a couple of minutes, but this is showing again where your FTEs are calculated on in column one of worksheet M-2. Again, this is for critical access hospitals that have provider-based RHCs. Um, so we want to make sure that that FTE total in there really reflects only the FTEs for RHC services and that we're removing some of those non-FTE services because that'll translate to um, the productivity standard or rather the minimum visits as calculated based on the productivity standards to be less and it reduces the risk that we will bump up against that and have our reimbursement decreased. 
And really the solution to this is reviewing our provider FTE and visit counts, making sure that we're appropriately removing our non-RHC services um, so that we're comparing apples to apples, right? That's the whole goal of that, of that worksheet. And so that is the solution there. And with that, we have come up to the conclusion of our cost report reimbursement opportunities. Again, as I mentioned, there's a whole lot of nuance in there. And if you've prepared cost reports, I'm sure that there are, there are lots of different ways where you can look at a slide and say, yeah, there are certain cases where you know, we have to consider this and, and that, and I completely understand that. I will leave some time for questions at this point, um, just in case you can feel free to type them in the chat. Uh, if you want, and I know we're monitoring that, the chat box there, um, but I do want to thank you all for joining in on this presentation. It's been great to talk to you. If you have a desire to talk more about the specifics of cost reporting, I'm happy to do that at any point. It is, uh, they, it, it will be a fascinating conversation, I'll say that, and um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to those potential conversations. At this point, I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Carla and my colleague, Christy Bishop, who are going to be talking about um, improving opioid management in primary care. And so welcome to you both. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Wade. I appreciate that. And I will share our screen and get started. All right. There we go. Um, all right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, I am joined by my colleague, uh, Christy Bishop, and we're very happy to be able to talk with you a little bit this afternoon about improving chronic opioid management in primary care. Um, we've had the great opportunity to work with a good number of clinics and have some um, just highlighted findings we are very happy to share with you today. So the first thing that we will do is to take a brief look at the um, U.S. opioid epidemic, um, not something that, um, it, that we've not heard about, but it's ever-changing. Um, just want to kind of recap and give some updates with um, some um, uh, new information. Um, talk about the six building blocks program. Um, that's where we have worked with um, clinics, hospitals and clinics around improving opioid management by using the six building blocks uh, processes. Um, and then Christy will share some of our findings from the field and we'll take some um, questions. And then we also have a good deal of information in our appendices as well. So for some background on the opioid epidemic, um, the opioid epidemic continues um, to um, grow um, in the uh, United States. Um, we have seen a growth of um, overdose deaths um, almost six times um, since uh, 1999. Um, but what has uh, just recently um, um, come out is um, the CDC has published in May, um, just last month, uh, the uh, provisional data around um, the um, opioid or overdose deaths, um, nearly 110,000 um, in 2022. And again, that is provisional data, um, but that is the latest and greatest information. And of course, that's um, a, another record high. Um, anyone is at risk um, for um, opioid overdose, anyone who uses the opioids, for um, pain management is at a risk. Um, there are, um, from CDC information, there are about 20% of um, adults in the United States that experience daily pain. Um, and then there are also, um, there's also been a few studies. Um, the one in JAMA in 2017 reported that 
there have there were about um, six percent of what we call opioid naive adult patients that continued to use um, opioids up to 90 days after minor or major surgical procedures. Now, that's changed a great deal in many states. Um, providers, when they are prescribing opioids for um, surgical procedures, have limited the amount that they are prescribing and then require the patient to come back and ask for a refill if they're still having um, surgical complications or pain. Um, the CDC does, um, has um, mentioned in several of their other documents that about one in four patients receiving long-term opioid therapy um, in primary care settings ends up with um, struggling with opioid addiction. So that's why primary care is just the ideal place to really focus a lot of our efforts in trying to um, improve the care that we give to these patients. Um, interestingly, the um, dispensing rate in 2020 um, was 43.3 prescriptions per 100 persons. Now that is down from to, uh, 2012 when the US, the overall US rate was 81.3 uh, prescriptions per 100 persons, but it still uh, varies significantly across the United States. So we see uh, the latest data of 2020 showing that Hawaii had a 27.3 prescriptions per 100 persons, all the way to a high of 80.4 um, prescriptions per 100 persons in Alabama. Um, this 2020 dispensing rate equates to more than 142 million opioid prescriptions and prescription opioids were involved in nearly 18% of all the opioid overdose deaths um, in the United States in 2020. Um, that is down um, from the 32% in 2018. Um, there is some provisional data that, that, um, that seems to look like we may have gone up just a bit, but that information is still not really um, available. So taking the prescription opioids for a longer period of time, of course, or at higher dosages um, can definitely impact um, the uh, negative outcome of overdose um, and or death. Um, but primary care providers account for nearly half of all the dispensed opioid prescriptions. And when we first started doing this work, that was uh, a little perplexing to me because I felt like Oh, that's probably the uh, providers that are, um, you know, prescribed more would be our emergency department or our surgeons and so forth. But that's really not the case. Primary care providers are um, the ones that um, account for nearly half. Um, but there is also a body of evidence that shows that the long term therapy on opioids is really not that effective for chronic pain. There are many other things that. Um, we should really look at um, to try to manage um, our patients that need um, pain, uh, pain medication. So what would be the uh, potential benefits of improving um, our long-term opioid therapy management? Well, we definitely see an improved patient safety and quality of care um, by having a lower percentage of our patients on high dose opioids and then fewer patients on long-term um, opioid therapy. There is a reduced risk of patient overdose and death. Um, by really focusing proactively on this high-risk patient population, we can also see reduced hospital readmissions and ED utilization because there is a really high um, ED utilization for substance use disorder patients. Um, and that there's some information in the appendix about that, which would be um, interesting for you to take a look at as well. Um, and interesting too, is that the overall chronic condition data shows that 50% of the Medicare members um, that have drug uh, abuse or substance use diagnoses 
also had five plus other chronic conditions, which is really interesting. Um, there may be low prevalence, but high ED utilization and uh, inpatient readmission for this um, patient population. Um, there's also an increased revenue opportunity because our primary care providers can also work with this patient population um, and those that do have these chronic conditions under the chronic uh, care management and complex chronic care management services. So a little bit about six building blocks. Six building blocks is just the name of a program um, that is an evidence-based quality improvement roadmap. And it helps our primary care practices um, and clinics to implement um, consistent and more patient-centered evidence-based uh, care for these chronic pain patients that are on the long-term opioid therapy. Basically giving that practice some standardization among their providers and around their practices so that they don't have variation in uh, treatment plans. Um, this was developed by the University of Washington Department of Family Medicine and Kaiser um, uh, Washington Health Research Institute and did have federal and state uh, funding support. And the results showed that quantitative improvements in patient care, care and safety and quality, qualitative improvements with the patient provider and staff experience. So overall, when um, the program was developed, they showed right out of the gate a lot of improvements. Um, so the Six Building Blocks program also has been included um, in the 2016 CDC guidelines, and we now have the new 2022 CDC guidelines for prescribing opioids for chronic pain, and it was also included in the um, IHI um, resources toolkit. Um, the um, team, the research team that began um, the six building blocks program started a research project um, as a trial and they pulled 20 rural and rural serving clinics um, out Eastern Washington State and Central Idaho. Um, this program lasted for 15 months um, to help these clinics implement six building blocks. So they received this external support for that length of time. They created an opioid um, quality improvement team at each of the sites. They also had kickoff events with clinic-wide self-assessments of the six building blocks. They had a practice coach that helped to um, facilitate their meetings. They also had shared learning calls where they could network together. And then they had um, monthly uh, University of Washington telepain participation. Um, their clinical trial results, and this is just a couple of the items that um, they found showed that the um, number of patients on chronic opioid therapy dropped um, over that 15 month period. And also their percent of patients with um, the morphine, what they call the morphine milli equivalent dosage of greater than um, 100 uh, per day uh, dropped as well. Um, so those were two um, benchmarks, two metrics that they really wanted to um, to monitor to see what happened once they implemented this program in those clinics. Um, some of the feedback that they received um, after that particular pilot, um, some statements, uh, quotes from some of the individuals within these clinics. Um, there was a medical director that talked about the turmoil that they had prior to implementing this program, because as I said, standardization um, helps to make everything more consistent, less variability, and provides a, a decent de uh, deal of comfort um, throughout the clinic. So they felt, this medical director felt like they didn't have the turmoil that they had before. Um, a nurse mentioned that they had, um, they did see a lot more teamwork by instituting this program. Um, and then one of the physicians um, had mentioned, and I, I just mentioned uh, morphine milli equivalents, um, this particular physician, what they call inherited a patient, 
So that happens when one of the providers leave and you, you, you know, uh, now have their patients to care for. Um, but that particular patient had gone down to um, a morphine milli equivalent of 80, which for that particular person was um, a great jump. And the patient had mentioned to the physician that they were more functional um, and that their pain wasn't even di any different and it may even be better. So there were positive um, reflections after the um, institution of this, of this program. And I will turn the uh, findings from the field over to my colleague, Christy. Thanks, Carla. You can go ahead and change the slide. Um, so today, um, Strawwater has worked with four hospitals or systems within three states implementing the, state, the six building blocks program. Our data in, um, that we found that we were gathering was from 16 clinics, which comprised of 61 surveys. To do the project, the six building project includes a orientation, if you will, for the administrators, um, clinic staff to introduce the six building block program. Um, then some data is collected, um, an implementation of a opioid improvement team with a provider and clinic champions. Um, the clinic self-assessments um, are to be completed by staff in the clinics clinics to identify any current gaps in their opioid management that they have. Um, interviews will be conducted with prescribing physician and providers um, and the clinic staff and administration. And then some in-depth surveys will be completed by the uh, clinic staff to better understand what their current process with chronic pain management and opioid management practices are and policies within and across the clinics and individual providers at the level on that particular level. Once all those steps are completed, um, it, it gives us, um, we can identify some variation and gaps and current practices, and it allows us to see some opportunities and we can then offer some recommendations for the clinic to impl implement and improve their opioid pain management and their patient outcomes. Slide, please. Thank you. Um, so some of the highlights that we're gonna talk about is, does the provider use some resources when they're prescribing their opioids? And the frequency of, and reason of seeing their patients on those opioid therapies. Um, do they use um, controlled substance agreements? And um, are we calculating the patient's daily dose, um, total dose for those patients? And are we tailoring it to their pain needs? Um, how are we communicating with our patients in regards to pain management and opioid therapy? Are we doing um, patient screening and assessments? And do you have a use of um, a, an, a, reg a registry of some sort? Slide, please. So the patient, are we one of the questions that we posed was, are, the, are they using um, the CDC guidelines um, to help um, take manage their chronic pain patients? And 66% um, of them said they always did. Utilizing the CDC guidelines ensures that the patient has the appropriate and safe treatment, minimizing the risk and of addiction and overdose while optimizing their pain management strategy. Um, slide, please. So the other question we posed was, how often are they seeing their patients? And in some of them, they see them monthly, every three months, every six, annually, or when the patient is, is requesting. 45% uh, said monthly and 31% said every three months. It is, it is um, by seeing our patients monthly allows the providers to monitor their treatment um, and the, effect, the effectiveness of the treatment, whether or not it's benefiting them and address any additional needs that's coming along with those opioid therapies. In addition to ensuring that the patient is on the best, pan, best plan to control their pain while ma managing their patient outcomes and, and their overall well-being. And the other one that we asked was, are we asking our patients to come in prior to refilling their medications? And 48% and of the um, the answers were were all always and nineteen was sometimes offering them to come in and but prior to refilling their op refilling their opioid 
um, prescription allows them to again reassess their pain management, make sure that 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 is effective effectively handling their pain, and and any additional any additional needs that they might need that this opioid may cause after being on it for a, a prolonged time, um, and to promote some safety and minimize some risks in the meantime before, prior to uh, refilling their medication. Um, slide please. So. We also ask if they were on any patient agreements, um, which if which um, 61 of them said yes. So an agreement is like a partnership between the patient and the provider. It allows them to establish a clear guideline and the patient's understanding of their treatment and expectations of what is coming with an opioid therapy and help them understand um, the potential side effects and minimizing the risk of misuse or diversion of the medications. Um, slide, please. So our next question is: um, Are we calculating the the dose for? A, are we calculating a daily dose for the providers? Sixty four percent of them was um, NA, but thirty four percent said always, and one percent said um, sometimes. And by calculating their daily dose. It, it, it gives them a tailored treatment, if you will, to make sure that we're, we are um, promoting the best pain management for that patient. And again, reduces the risks and it provides them a tailored, tailored medication for their pain. In some of the facilities and, and clinic offices, excuse me, they have um, a med calculator on their computers or, or even a med calculator link that allows their staff to go ahead and calculate that pain medication and put a note for the provider to see the pain med was calculated for that patient prior to entering the room to do their assessment. So that patient, that provider can review the calculated dose for the patient before even entering the room to see the patient. The, the question is, are we establishing treatment goals with the chronic pain patients before starting an opioid um, therapy for a chronic pain? And 48% of them said, Yes. Um, discussing and establishing treatment goals with the chronic pain patient before initiating the opioid therapy is essential for the patients as, as it helps align their expectations and promotes a patient-centered care. Establish, and it also allows us to establish uh, measurable outcomes and guides the treatment process and optimizes long patient uh, pain management for our patients. Um, slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this one is, are we routinely discussing known side effects, real, real expectations, benefits of an opioid therapy for chronic pain patients who are considering opioid therapy? Discussing these, these benefits and realistic outcomes is important to ensure that the patients are making an informed decision. So I recently had a family member who was dealing with some terrible hip pain for quite some time, was looking for her doctor to relieve this pain. So she went to the doctor, they put her on an opioid and um, fast forward to two, three weeks later, she gives me a call and says, I'm really disappointed. I'm, I'm still having pain. I'm not, I, she was hoping to have all the activities and being able to do things that she used to do. She's still not able to do the activities. If anything, she's doing less because she's exhausted. She's having other side effects from the opioid. And so that just told me that her and her provider were not on the same page and communicating with one another of what the real, real outcome of that pain medication is. You're still gonna have some pain. This is to bridge the gap. So having that conversation, she did not have that. So it's so important for them to have an ex, a realistic expectation of what that pain med is going to do for them. Um, slide, please. Are we doing some screening and assessments? And when I'm referring to that, are we doing random pill counts? And when we pose that question, 25% uh, of them said yes. Random pill counts are important for our doctors to help monitor and ensure the proper use of those medications and, and to prevent from misuse or diversion and, and potential harm to our patients. The other screening is random uh, urine drug screens. Are we doing those? And some said start at the, they did at the start and annually every three months or every six months. And you can see at the start was 24%, and then um, annually was 22, and every three months was 12%. 
doing random tests again is is crucial to 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 treating those patients because we want to make sure that they're adhering to the prescribed amount of medications and to the right medications that we're prescribing. And they're potentially not misusing or diverting the medications somewhere else. Well, and also promoting a safe, um, responsible opioid use with our patient. Slide, please. So when I speak of a registry, when we ask the patients, is that have you maintained a list or registry for your chronic patients for long-term therapy? Look at it as a checklist. Um, when we asked that question, 25% of them said yes and 39% said no. So look at it as a checklist as we're getting one or two steps ahead of our patients. Uh, when we pro provide that opioid medication, when do we want them in for a random drug count? When do we want to do it? Who's up for a random urine screen? Um, about a follow-up appointment. If we could get it in, in our EHR, give us a tickler or an alert of some sort saying, this patient's ready for a, a drug screen or a, um, um, excuse me, a random pill count, it makes it easier for, track, for us to track. So that concludes our data um, that, that we found in the field. And I'm gonna now open it up to questions. Carla, is that what we're gonna do? I, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So we're gonna open it up to any questions that you may have, and if you, would just go ahead and put those in our chat box. We'd be happy to answer those for you. Hi, Carla and Christy. Christy. Um, it, looks, it looks like we have, a, like we have. Um, a couple of questions coming in. Um, so the first question um, here in the chat is, how have these clinics dealt with pushback from providers? Um, do you care if I go ahead, Carla? No, please. Yeah. Okay. So having a physician champion is part of the strategic plan for the six building blocks. Oh, and when you have the champion in charge, the physician champion in charge of helping develop and move that program through the system, they also help answer those questions and, and answer some of the concerns. Usually it's a concern that a physician has when they're giving pushback on a program such as this, but having them support the program and and, and um, help driving the program usually gets them all in line. Is, is there anything else you wanna to add to that, Carla? Yeah, um, sure. Yeah, we and we have had um, in several situations, staff members um, in the very beginning say, you know, they weren't really sure if their providers would buy into this. And we um, we want to you know, reassure them that this, we're not asking um, the providers to do more work. Um, I know everyone has enough to do. What we're trying to do is, as I mentioned earlier, provide that um, that that less variation, more of a consistent practice to help them um, de-stress some of the situations that happen with this um, complex. Uh, patient population. So instituting these processes will keep everything um, consistent. And when you do have a provider that has to manage another provider's patient, um, then there's no surprise um, because all of our patients are being managed um, the same way. So I think that kind of um, reassures them that it's not something else they have to do. It's something to help streamline um, their their work that they're already doing in their clinic. Thank you, uh, Carla and Christy. Um, so the next question that came in is, why would you want providers who do not prescribe opioid medications to be part of this program? Well, in, in that situation, um, kind of piggybacking on their uh, first question, if you have providers within your clinic that do not prescribe, typically prescribe opioids, but they have a patient that needs to be seen, uh, another provider's patient that needs to be seen, they need to understand what the processes are. They may not be someone who prescribes, um, but they need to understand what processes we have in place at our clinic um, to, you know, to help prevent 
overuse or misuse and to manage the complex patients. So everyone within the practice needs to be part of um, uh, understanding part of the program. Was Thanks, Carla. Um, we have one more uh, so far, and this one says, how long does it take to implement a program like this? Christy, do you want me to take that? I can too. Um, so it depends. You know, it, it varies between uh, facilities. Um, some are, some facilities are smaller than others. Some are, are larger than others, and they're some have pushback and some don't. So um, th there's a lot to it. Um, it all depends on how quickly we can move through the process that I gave earlier of implementing the program and how quickly the facility wants to move forward. So there, there's several different pieces to the puzzle and it varies between different facilities and how quickly they want it to, to move forward because um, you want to have the best program for your facility. So giving that answer is kind of a a hard question to answer depending on the size of your facility. Anything else you want to add? Yeah, and in addition to that, it depends on where you already, you know, where you are in this type of process. Um, we've worked with clinics who already have um, some of the agreements in place, maybe have some policies in place, but they don't have everything standardized. And they may, so they may be a lot farther ahead than a clinic that doesn't have anything in place or that has um, you know, a lot of providers in this particular clinic or clinics, and they all do things in a different way. So um, it really just, it, 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 you take stock at the very beginning um, where the clinics do a self-assessment of how much variation they have and what they already have in place. And you can kind of gauge from there how long it may take. Um, to get the program off the ground. Thank you, Carla and Christy. Um, and it looks like um, that is it for questions. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I did want to go through, we do have some things in the appendix, just for your knowledge. I won't go over all of these, but um, you know, please take a look. It's really good information goes through the six building blocks core elements um, as well, and um, uh, trying to give you a gauge of the, and go back to the other question, some of what um, the, just the average, um, the stage of implementation stages of this type of program, um, and then how you, you form an opioid improvement team. Um, the information, um, just a snapshot of information that's used for the um, clinic self-assessment of their, um, you know, of, of where they are in the very beginning. Um, there's also some more information in Appendix B on um, opioids, some other information on drug addiction um, and data on substance use disorders. And then the information that I referred to earlier about chronic conditions data. Um, so this shows what the um, prevalence is as far as ED visits, um, with your chronic conditions, your hospital readmissions, and so on. And then a little bit more on the impacts of the programs. We've also added all of our sources, um, and we thank you for attending. You will um, have a, uh, a, a survey that, that comes up um, after um, we exit the webinar, and we really hope that you will um, take the time to do the survey. It helps us um, and we want your feedback and we really appreciate your time in attending the conference today. Thank you. Thank you, Carla and Christy, and thank you so much to everyone who joined us for this conference. Have a great rest of your day.